should be able to see my, my slides. They should be staring right at you. The COVID-19 pandemic and investment treaty arbitration. So um, let me begin by saying, um, wherever you are, I hope you are all well. I'm not going to give a long-winded introduction because uh, I think I said I would take 15 minutes to get through the presentation. I want to try to respect the time limit, although I might not. So let's just jump in. Uh, here's a small overview of the, of the presentation. Uh, first, I'll give you some background on the connections between the COVID-19 pandemic and investment treaty arbitration. Hopefully what you, you'll see from that background is that there are, or there is fear in some quarters that there could be a flood of investment treaty claims related to um, COVID-19 measures. And because of that fear, there's been what I've called some flood risk management. Uh, we're going to look at a, a treaty or a proposed treaty that has been put on the table by an NGO. And then in the third part, I'll offer some legal commentary on the flood risk management, uh, the, the measures of the flood risk management, particularly this treaty. So let's go to the background. This is Act One. Um, this is pushed by the law firms, I've called it. So back in April, when, when the virus really came in, in, into Europe and, and, and North America, um, law firms started to, to put short summaries on, on their websites about the possibility of investors using investment treaties to claim for compensation that were caused by COVID-related measures. Um, the first such summary I found, um, well, the first one published came from the law firm Sherman and Sterling, and I think the highlight of the publication was this quote here, measures that are adopted in bad faith deprive investors of due process or are arbitrary, disproportionate or discriminatory may give rise to state liability under international law. And of course, once one law firm saw that another law firm was notifying clients or potential clients about their their rights under investment treaties in respect of harsh COVID-19 measures, other law firms started to, to follow. Um, before I leave this topic, I just wanna point out, um, I think it's perfectly legitimate for law firms to go on their website and advertise their services. And I point that out because I noticed that in some commentary, um, there was some sneering at the law firms for, for doing this. And I think it was undeserved. I think it was just, I mean, this type of sneering is really just a bit of very crude lawyer bashing, which I'm not going to uh, engage in. What I'm going to do now is talk about the pushback from some NGOs. Um, I think the, the most interesting one comes from a, a group that's affiliated with the Columbia University, the Columbia Center for Sustainable Investment. And they put out, a, sorry, they put out a call for ISDS moratorium during COVID-19 crisis and response. I'm not going to go through the, the whole call. I'll just put up in front of you the highlight of the call. And it reads like this. We call on the world community for an immediate moratorium on all arbitration claims by corporations against governments using investment treaties and a permanent restriction on all COVID-related arbitration claims. Now, if you're wondering, did I add the capitalized phrases in there and bold them? No, I didn't. That's the way it appeared in the letter. Uh, it was signed by some uh, very prominent people, I, I have to say. Um, one in particular, Jeffrey Sachs, who's a uh, prominent economist at uh, Columbia University. Um, other NGOs started to, to get on board with, with this kind of pushback. 
um, against the, the law firms, or I think more generally against the idea that investors could bring claims under investment treaties. Uh, one in particular, which is worth noting, uh, there was an open letter written by the Seattle to Brussels network um, it asked people obviously to sign it and over 600 NGOs have signed it so far. So this is a, a kind of a, a, um, a movement which is picking up, well, has picked up some pace. Um, what's the state of play right now, however? My research tells me that there are no COVID related investment treaty claims to date. Just note, however, there is one contract claim that has been filed against Peru for a COVID-related measure by an investor. But of course, a, a contract-based claim is something very different from an investment treaty claim. There have, however, been a number of threats of investment treaty arbitration uh, put by investors to states. So, we shouldn't think simply because at this point there haven't been any, that there won't be any in the future. I think we can probably expect there will be some. It's just a question of how many. Um, the other thing I, I want to point out is, is this. There has been a continuation of the filing of claims for investment treaty arbitration. Um, the other thing that some some states and also some NGOs were calling for is that they wanted pending arbitrations. That is arbitration started before COVID-19 during the pandemic to be somehow suspended or put on pause. And that has not happened. Uh, Pre-COVID-19 arbitrations have simply gone online now. And I understand that they are doing them via Zoom. I couldn't help it last week but the arbitral hearings for the never ending case of Vattenfall versus Germany were online last week. And I thought I'd have a little quick peek and, and see what was going on. So it, it seems to be working. Um, that's the, the, the state of play. Just to recap, um, some people see the possibility for investors to make claims under investment treaty under investment treaties claiming compensation for losses relating to COVID-19 measures. There's been a, a, a pushback by certain non-governmental organisations when they saw this flood risk. Um, one NGO, however, has really taken the, the next step. This is the International Institute for Sustainable Development. Um, they took the very practical step of drafting a treaty that states could sign. It's called the Agreement for the Coordinated Suspension of Investor State Dispute Settlement with respect to COVID-19 related measures and disputes. Well, wow, that's a real, uh, that's a lot to get out in one breath. Um, I'm just going to call it the Treaty for Suspending COVID Related ISDS. It's a little bit easier for me and perhaps for, for everybody. Um, whether this proposed treaty becomes a, an effective treaty in the future, uh, we don't know. All I know at the moment from the website of this NGO is that they are in a consultation period with negotiators from developing states, international law experts, and they say other civil society organisations. The most important article of, of the treaty reads as follows. Of course, I've condensed it down to try and fit on the, on the slide and also respect the, the time limit. So an investment treaty providing for ISDS is hereby suspended in respect of claims that the respondent signatory state considers to concern COVID-19 related measures. Now, I'm... First point, you'll notice that there is not some type of prohibition in the future on COVID-related investment arbitrations. They haven't gone that far. You can see the keyword here is they want to suspend such claims. Um, you'll be, I mean, you should be asking, well, when does this suspension end? 
Um, on the last draft of the treaty I saw, that article is still in brackets. So um, we, we don't know yet, unfortunately. Um, what I'll do with, with the rest of the time is, well, one, you'll have to look past the issue of when does the suspension end. Uh, in the last six, seven minutes, I want to cover three legal issues, which I think this particular provision here brings up. The first one, uh, unfortunately, my slides are not working now. If you can give me a minute here, I might be able to repair them. Okay, that seems to work. Um, comment number one concerns the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. This particular article here, Article 37, a right for a third state may not be revoked or modified if it was intended not to be revocable or subject to modification without the consent of the third state. Now, if you're looking at that, you should be asking yourself, well, what is the relevance of that particular article? And it's this, if the and two states have come together to sign this treaty and it looks like you, the investor, are going to lose. You might be able to say that me, as an investor, I have a right, a treaty right to investment arbitration. Uh, it was not intended to be modified and therefore it's going to be invalid under Article 37 of the Vienna Convention. That's going to be a difficult argument to make for three reasons. The first one is this, is the investor's access to arbitration a treaty right? This is a question that um, occupied jurists in international investment law about 15 years ago. It was a question that um, probably the, the, the most significant doctrinal question in the, in the field about 15 years ago. There's a lot of jurisprudence on it now, a lot of scholarship on it now. Um, my feeling is that yes, that access to arbitration is a treaty right, but I also, I also can see Professor Peters um, participating here, and I know that uh, she's an expert on it, so she might give her opinion on this matter during the question and answer session. The next big problem for you as an investor, if you want to use Article 37, can an investor benefit from Article 37? The Article 37 says it's a right for a third state. Clearly, uh, an investor is, is not a state. So the way that the investor could potentially get around this problem is to say that Article 37 is some type of it's a manifestation of a deeper principle in the law of, of treaties, namely that individual, individual rights in treaties cannot be revoked or modified without the consent of the individual. The final point, um, it's probably the, the most difficult one. You, you can see in the rule here, if it was intended that is the right, the treaty right. If the treaty right was intended not to be revocable or subject to modification, uh, I, I think it's going to be difficult for any investor to look into the contents of an investment treaty and say that there was no such intention there. Um, of course, it's going to depend on, on the treaty that you're talking about, but I think with those three problems there, uh, Article 37 can't be used by an investor to make an attack against the effectiveness of this suspension. Um, the other point that I, I want to talk about now, this is that it's a, it's a self-judging clause. Um, you, you'll note that the respondent state has to consider that the measure is a COVID-19 related measure. Um, the first point to note with respect to this matter is that in the commentary for this draft treaty, it is specified that this self-judging clause is subject to a good faith criterion. Pardon me. The other thing that, that I have a question about is the function of this self-judging clause. So 
I mean, it, it, its function is not specified and it could have one of three functions. So just focusing first on the jurisdiction point there. Um, if, for example, a state goes out and declares this measure here is a COVID related measure, does this mean that the arbitral tribunal lacks jurisdiction over a claim which complains about that measure? Um, does it mean that the claim is inadmissible? Or thirdly, looking at the merits there, does it give the, the state some kind of defence that it can rely on when the arbitral tribunal is looking at the question of international responsibility under the applicable treaty? So can the state say, wait, we've got a defence here, we declare this particular provision to be a COVID-19 related, um, COVID related measure, and therefore we have a, a perfect defence to any breach of the treaty. Um, I've actually assumed it has a jurisdictional function, but I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I think it should be specified. And the reason why it should be specified is because it matters uh, whether a, an arbitral tribunal doesn't have jurisdiction or whether the court, or sorry, whether the um, respondent state can plead a COVID-19 related defense. They are obviously two very different legal outcomes. Third comment here, um, doctrinal necessity, I've called this one. So there, there's an assumption going on. Um, there's an assumption that in international investment law, there are not the doctrinal concepts in that area of law that can adequately balance the interests of states and investors. So to, to further flesh out this point, uh, if you did not know anything about international investment law until you started listening to this presentation, you, you might get the feeling that, okay, um, if an investor is adversely affected by a COVID-19 related measure, then the investor has a very good possibility of claiming compensation with an investment treaty. Now, that's, I think that's a very simplistic view of the matter. There are a number of defences that, that states can plead, and these defences are meant to apply in circumstances such as um, COVID-19 pandemics. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of, of, of those defences. I did originally when I was planning this presentation. The, the problem is I find that the conversation gets uh, far too abstract unless you're dealing with a very specific case. Uh, you're dealing with a, a, a situation where an investor has identified a measure and, and said, yes, this measure breaches my rights under the treaty, and then you can look at whether the defence applies. So if you don't mind, I'm going to actually look very briefly at another issue. And you'll, you'll have to forgive me for indulging myself. If you know me a little bit, you'll know that uh, I like issues of, of, of causation. And in COVID-19 related disputes that will come up in future arbitrations, I can foresee a juicy causation question coming up. And it's this one. In cases of causal overdetermination, has the state still caused the investor's loss? That needs a little bit of fleshing out. So here's the situation. The investor proves that the COVID related measure causes its investment loss. So the state has actually caused the investment loss. However, because of the economic fallout of the pandemic, the state is able to prove that even if it did not act, the investor's loss would have been the same. In those two situations where you have two causes that could have, could have caused the outcome, is the state still, or is the state's conduct still the legal cause of, of the investor's loss? Uh, hopefully um, some of you might have some opinions on that and you might share them with us during the Q&A session. For now, I need to finish up here if my slides are going to let me, they are. Some take home messages, uh, no flood 
of investment treaty claims yet. Second point is, I think there's a distinct lack of trust in arbitral tribunals because this, this proposed treaty could be really quite simple. It could just simply say um, all the signatory states to this treaty, they agree that arbitral tribunals lack jurisdiction over COVID-related uh, cases and then give a definition of COVID-related cases and then leave it to the arbitral tribunals to decide what is a COVID related case. And they haven't taken that approach. They've given the discretion over to states. Uh, final point is this one here. My suspicion is this, um, when those people in the camp that oppose investment treaty arbitration saw the possibility that investors could use investment treaties to claim compensation for their losses. Uh, I think they saw it as, as a chance to further try and um, show that investment treaty arbitration is, is, is illegitimate. Um, whether that's the case or not, I don't offer any, any opinion on. I'll just say that I think it, it's, it's probably in the future, this episode will form part of a, a chapter of a bigger story of the legitimacy of international investment law. And I think I can finish on that point. So thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to your questions.